because we're going to go through a whole lot of scriptures. It's a little different style uh, message for me today than what I normally bring because it is a special day. As you just noticed, today is the day that we're going to honor our graduates. So those who have graduated or are about to graduate from high school and college, we don't want to forget those. Do we have, do we have some that are graduating from college coming up this semester? If that's you, raise your hand at me. Let me see what we got coming up. We have some people graduating college. Thank you uh, for what you do and spending time studying. Um, I was thinking about today's service. And as I was thinking about today's service, we got a Facebook reminder, Facebook message reminding us, listen to this. I know you're not going to believe this, but it is true. My high school 20-year reunion is coming up this year. Actually, it's 21 years. It was supposed to be last year, but it was canceled due to conflicts. So my 20-slash-21-year high school reunion is coming up this summer. Now, that hit me like a ton of bricks. I've been out of high school for 21 years. I've been out of college for 17 years. Mom and Dad, you're getting old. My parents are in town today. <laughs> As I was thinking about that, I'm like, what? What are some of the life lessons that I've learned in the last 21 years? And all of those lessons begin to run through my mind like a freight train carrying cars, hundreds of life lessons. And I thought, we don't have time to go through that. And most of you could care less. So since this is a spiritual time, this is a sermon, I thought I would narrow them down to 10 things, 10 spiritual things that I think graduates should know. Now, don't check out on me, old people. This is for you too. I'm sorry, you're not old. You're well advanced in years. Don't check out on me because these will apply to you. Let's start with this premise, shall we? If you're a child of God, you will succeed. If you're a child of God, you will succeed. God put that in your DNA. You can do no less but to succeed. Why? Because for a Christian, success is defined totally differently than a person who is in the world. As a Christian, we do not define success by money, by materialism, by job titles, or the corner office. We define success by remaining faithful to fulfill the will of God that he has for our life. Therefore, we define success by the legacy we leave. Only history will truly reveal those who are successful and those who are not. Think with me over the last few decades of all the people that we thought were successful. Had fame, fortune, only to find out they were cooking the books, having affairs, bankrupting their businesses. They weren't successful. They gave the appearance of being successful, but they really were not because they were not faithful to do within the parameters of godly principles that they were faithful or supposed to do. So what do we do then? We have to live life with the future in mind, knowing that only history will record if we were faithful or not. At the end of the day, it's not how much money you make. It's not the size of your house. It's not what kind of car you drive. It's not what job title you have or where your office is located. What matters when you stand before God is did you do what God required of you to do? That's success. And for a child of God, if your heart is right with him and your heart is to carry out the will of God, you will be successful. Amen? Now, 10 points. Ten things that I think graduates, indeed, all of us should remember. Number one, God is a good God. God is a good God. Listen to the scripture in Acts 10 and verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. James 1.17. 
Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit who went about doing good. James tells us that God is a good God and that every gift is good and that every gift is perfect when it comes from God. Now listen to me. At the time you are going through something, you may not think it's good. And you may not think it's perfect. But one day you'll look back and you will realize that everything that God put into your life was good and it was perfect because it molded you and it shaped you and it formed you to be the person that you are so that you could carry out the will of God. God is a good God. Number two, God is love. God is love. Listen to the scripture, 1 John 4. Verses 7 through 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, it's not that God can love. It's not that God does love. God is love. You cannot separate love from his being. He is love. He loves the righteous and the unrighteous. Listen to the scripture. John 3, verses 16 through 17. You know, you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but through the world that he might be saved. In other words, God so loved the world that he gave Jesus Christ that every person can find salvation through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's his love. He has love for his creation. He has love for humanity. He's not willing that any should perish and spend an eternity in hell. He wants everyone to come to a salvation knowledge of himself. That's his love. He loves us. Now, there's a perversion of this teaching today. You hear it all the time. God is love. God is loving, therefore God accepts me. No, no, no. God loves you too much to leave you the way you are. Think about it. God loves you too much to leave you the way you are. Because I don't know if you know this or not, but you messed up. And so am I. And we were severely messed up before we came into a salvation experience with Jesus Christ. And it was at that moment that God shed his love to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And once we accept him, he's in the process of making us into what we can be for him. He loves you too much to leave you where you are. He wants you to be everything that he's created you to be. He doesn't want you to wallow in pain and misery and suffering. He loves you too much for that. He can give you peace and healing and joy and deliverance. That's the kind of love that God has for us. And there is nothing that you can do that can separate you from his love. Listen to the scripture, Romans 8, verses 38 through 39. Paul writes, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And your worst most unlovable moment God is still crazy about you this leads us into point number three we can live a life free from fear we can live life free from fear because we are secure in God's love because we are secure in God's love We can live free of fear. Listen to 
what Paul writes in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. When you're in that relationship with God, and you just get a glimpse of the love that he has for you, that love, perfect love, cast out all fear. So he didn't give you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. We can live free of fear because we know that God is for us and that he will help us in whatever we endeavor to do. Kelly and I have been really fortunate in our lives to do some really cool things because we weren't afraid to try. Because here's my thought process. Every light's a green light till I get a red light. Most people approach life with every light's a red light until you get a green light. Man, I'm the other way around. Every door is open. Every light is green until God stops me. And I have no fear to do something when God has put it in my heart to do it. Because I figure he doesn't want to fail. It's not me failing. It's him. If he put it in my heart to do it, I can do it. If not, he would put it in my heart to do it. See, we can live life free from fear. No matter what God has put in your heart to do. Madison, no matter what God has put in your heart to do, you can do it. Why? Because God put it there, and he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. And so we can live life free of fear. Listen to the scriptures. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Fear not, the Lord says. I am with you. Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You see, we can live a life free of fear because we know that God is with us. And if God is with us, then who can be against us? We can live a life free of fear because we can rest assured that nothing comes into our life that God has not permitted. I, I, I realize that challenges your thinking. But if you're a child of God, nothing comes into your life that he has not permitted. Therefore, he's given you the ability to overcome it. And number two, listen to this. We can live a life free of fear because nothing can happen to us. Nothing can happen to us until it's time for it to happen to us. Listen to this. Matthew chapter 10, verses 27 through 31. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who was able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? Did you catch that? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. And he must keep a running total because some fall out. Can I get a witness? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. You see, we can live a life free of fear because the world could do nothing to me that God has not allowed. One sparrow does not fall to the ground outside of God's will. And you are of more value than a bird. You are of more value than a dog, than a cat, than a cow, than a horse. I know I'm upset you Peter people, but you'll get over it. You are more valuable than an animal. Humans are created in the image of God, not animals. You are of more value, and nothing can happen to you. You do not fall to the ground apart from God's will. See, we need to get a fresh revelation of the sovereignty of God. 
if our heart is right as children of God, and we want to carry out the will of God for our lives, then we can live a life free of fear because nothing can happen to me until God first designs it. Number four, God has a plan for your life. Principles that we've learned. God has a plan for your life. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Listen to this. We are created in Christ Jesus. We are his workmanship created in him to do good works which God has prepared beforehand beforehand before you ever got saved God had a plan for your life and the moment you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior God opened up the blueprint God opened up the scroll God opened up the plan for your life and you begin to walk out the will of God for you and it was prepared before you were ever born again I did not start out to be a preacher I did not start out to be a pastor, even when I was called into the ministry. But God had a plan before I ever committed my life to him. He knew where I was going to be. He knew what I was going to be doing, even though I didn't know it. And even though my education took me in a totally different course. I didn't go to seminary. I didn't go to Bible college. Not that I'm opposed to those things, but that wasn't God's plan for my life. I was recruited in all kinds of schools to go and play baseball, and I begged God, let me go here and let me go there. Every boy grows up in Louisiana wanting to play at LSU. Well, I made it to LU, and our colors were purple and gold. I was close. I didn't pray hard enough. I left off the S. Pursuing political science, minor communication. I was going to be an FBI agent and a politician. You could have been voted for me instead of Trump. my junior year, God called me to ministry. And even then, I was going to be an evangelist. So when my pastor called and said, hey, our youth pastor just resigned and he left, would you consider taking the youth? I said, no, sir. I'm going to be an evangelist. He says, will you pray about it? And I was like, whatever, okay. That's where I messed up. I shouldn't have prayed, but I did. God opened the door. Process of time, here we are. Because God knew what he designed me to do way before I did. See, God has a plan for your life. And don't try to figure it out. Because if he showed you what you would really be doing and where you would be, you probably wouldn't want to do it. Preaching would have been the furthest thing from my mind. But God providentially led me to the school that I went to, received the education that I did, because he knew it would help me in today's world and culture to know history to know politics, to know theology, to know philosophy, because all of those are merging today in a cultural war. He knows what he's doing. Trust him. Trust him. He is sovereign. And he has a plan for your life. And it's a good plan because God is a good God and because God loves you and you don't have to fear and you don't have to worry because it will come to pass. He has a plan for you. Just have ears to hear and follow his commands even when it doesn't make sense and in the end it will be good. The prophet Jeremiah writes in 29 verse 11, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope that Jeremiah was prophesying to his nation. That there were, God still thinks good thoughts for them, even though they were in judgment, even though they were suffering things. God still thought good thoughts for them. He was going to bring them peace and hope, and he will do the same for you. No matter what you're going through, God thinks of you. And when he thinks of you, he thinks good things, and he wants to give you a future and a hope. Don't fear and don't worry. 
your plan will come to pass. Or his plan for your life will come to pass. Number five. Everybody say number five. That means I'm almost done. God has designed you to be an overcomer. God has designed you to overcome. Romans 8, verses 35 through 37. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you are facing, you are an overcomer. You will make it. Just like when Jesus put the disciples in that boat and he said, cross over to the other side. When they got in the middle of that sea, all of a sudden a storm came. But what happened? They made it to the other side because that was God's will for them to get to the other side. They made it through the storm. And so are you. If you were in the will of God, and even though there is a storm on your sea of life, I want you to know, keep the faith. God is a good God. He loves you. He has a plan for your life. And you will make it to the other side. Why? Because he has to decides you to overcome. You cannot fail. It's in your DNA as a child of God to overcome no matter what obstacle is in your way. Now, not only has he designed you to be an overcomer, but number six, he has designed others to help you overcome. Look to your neighbor and say, I know you need some help. Uh Uh-huh. Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how could one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another. Two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. The picture is military. The, the, the picture is body heat, even when they're camping out in harsh conditions. You can keep each other warm. If one is attacked, his friend can help him. And a threefold cord, meaning the person of the Holy Spirit involved in any relationship, cannot be broken, easily broken. And so God, listen to this, has put people into your life to help you overcome obstacles to get to where you're supposed to be. Because you can't do it alone. Like it or not, you need other people. The principle was given to us, even in the book of Genesis. Adam named all the animals, none comparable to him. So what happened? God put Adam to sleep, created Eve, And she was his helpmate. Equal. But they helped one another. She helped him. The principle is, man was not designed to be alone. Now that doesn't mean that every person is supposed to get married. But it does mean that every person is not supposed to be alone. God has designed others to help you. That's why you have a church. That's why you have a community of believers. We come together and we encourage one another and we spur one another along. We need each other. One of my favorite quotes is by a gentleman named George Eliot. Listen to what he wrote on this topic. And I quote, Oh, the comfort, the inexpressible comfort of feeling safe with a person, having neither to weigh thoughts nor measure words, but pouring them all out just as they are, chaff and grain together, certain that a faithful hand will take and sift them, Keep what is worth keeping, and with the breath of kindness, blow the rest away. You know, to have that person in your life or people in your life that when you're going through something, you can just pour that out. Even though you know that your thinking is probably not right at that moment, there's still stuff on the inside of you that you just need to get out. And you need those people around you that you can trust, that to support you, and you just pour it out. And they know what is worth keeping and what is worth blowing away. And because love covers a multitude of sins, they don't go and blast it around to everybody. They just blow it away because they know that's not really you. 
You see, God has designed others to help you. In the multitude of counselors, there is safety, the scripture says. And so we need other people so that we can overcome obstacles and we don't allow root of bitterness to take place in our heart so that we can become all that God has destined for us to become. Number seven. Contentment. Contentment is attainable. Did you know you could be content in life? Not one single amen. So let me say that again. Did you know you could be content in life? Yes. Yeah, you strive for more. God put a work ethic in us. Increase is a part of a children of God. I understand that. But you can still be content. Why? Even though you work to increase, you don't cross over into covetousness. That's sin. But God put a work ethic in us. And he expects us to work and expects us to increase in the area of the gifts and talents that he's given us. You remember the parable? Jesus gave him 10, 5, so forth. So according to the degree of the talent that God gave them, it's a degree that they should increase. We're not all equal. We're not. Well, I mean, we're equal in value. But some of us are tall and some of us are short. Some of us are skinny and some of us are not so skinny. Some of us are intelligent. Some of us not so much. It's true. We're, we're all equal in value, but we're not given all equal talents and gifts and abilities. But what we are given, we're expected to be faithful stewards and increase in it. But even as we're working to increase, we can be content with where we are. Listen to how Paul words this. Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I've learned whatever state I'm in to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul said, whatever state I'm in, I've learned to be content. I know how to be a base and I know how to abound. But between you and I, it's a whole lot more foreign to abound. Isn't it? But even in that moment when we are abased, we can be content because again, we know that God has a plan for our life and he is a good God and therefore it is a good plan and I can overcome no matter what I'm going through. You see, for a Christian, we should be some of the most joyful people on the face of the planet. Why? Because we have joy deep down on the inside of us that nobody can take. I can forfeit it, I could turn it over, but nobody can take it from me. Because my joy and my peace and my contentment is not based on what has happened around me at any given moment. My joy and my peace is based on my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 1611 reads, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. My joy is not found in money. My joy is not found in what kind of car I drive. My joy is not found in how many people attend church or don't attend church on a Sunday. My joy is found in the presence of Almighty God. Now I get upset when you don't come to church. But you're not taking my joy. Right? We, we have joy based on the presence of God. Romans 14, 7, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Number eight, out of the 10 things that I've learned in the last 21 years, here's the important one. God will provide for your needs. God will provide for your needs. Now listen to me. 
He doesn't always provide for your wants. He doesn't always provide for your desires. He always provides for your needs. If, if you follow biblical principles for financial management, God will provide for your needs. Here they are. You, you, want, you want to guarantee that God will provide for you? There are several things you do. Number one, tithe. Tithe. Malachi 3, verses 8 through 12. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. And see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. And of course, this was his covenant with Israel. But I want you to understand, tithing was found in the word of God law before the law ever came into existence. Tithing was practiced at least 430 years before the law was ever given to Moses. So therefore, tithing is a principle for those who have really had an encounter with Almighty God. It is natural for us to want to give back to him because we realize we don't really own anything anyway. It's all his and we merely manage what he's given us. And so we tithe. Another thing we do is we give to the poor. You want to guarantee God's financial blessing upon you and provision for you? Then you tithe. And number two, you give to the poor. Proverbs 19 and 17 reads, He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. Whenever, whenever God puts it in your heart to reach out to someone who is in poverty, reach out to someone who is struggling, and you give to them, it is as if you are given to God, and God will pay you back plus some. Because he will be in debt to no man. Number three, give to missions. Give to missions. Again, Paul writes in Philippians 4, verses 14 through 19. Nevertheless, he's writing to the church at Philippi. He says, nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift. Listen to what Paul is writing. Listen to this. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Most Christians quote that last verse. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. You can't claim that if you don't give to missions. Because the whole context of that is that Paul was saying, when I was on my missionary journey, when I left Philippi, Macedonia, and so forth, Thessalonica, you sent money to me. You took care of me. You met my needs. And because of that, God is keeping in total. God is keeping account of what's happening. And he will supply all of your needs. And so if you want to guarantee God's financial provision for you, you tithe, you give to the poor, you give to missions, and lastly, you give to the kingdom overall. Whenever God puts it in your heart to give to another church or to give to another Christian or what, another ministry, then give because that's part of giving to the kingdom, and God promises to bless you whenever you do that. Scripture reads in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 5 through 8. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time or prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, 
that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have abundance for every good work. Now, I realize a lot of people will take that and they'll say, see, we don't have to tithe anymore. We can just give what God puts in our heart. Well, no, 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 because the context is there were one church was receiving a love offering to give to another church. Didn't have anything to do with tithing. It had to do with one church given to another church. And what Paul was saying is just pray and let the Lord put it in your heart what you want to give. Determine in your heart what you give. The tithe is dictated, 10%. But everything else is up to you and the Lord as a matter of obedience. Whatever it is that he puts in your heart, be obedient to that. And whenever you do, then God will promise to bless you accordingly and you will have abundantly, you will have more than enough to do the good works that God has put in your path to do. So no matter what, and no matter where, if you follow biblical principles, God will bless you. Number nine, I'm nearing the end. I've, I've turned left for the last time on the track, and I'm going down the straight way. Here we go. Number nine, keep the proper perspective. Keep the proper perspective. Learn to see the big picture. Everybody look at me. Everybody look at me. Here's a principle I learned. It took me 21 years to learn this because I'm not too bright. Here it is. It's not what you look at, but what you see that matters. It's not what you look at, but what you see that matters. Let me give you an example. You look at this. But when I look at in the mirror, I see this. That's me before I go to the tanning bed. <laughs> no, in all seriousness. In all seriousness. Show the next one. Buff PBJ. That's funny. Thank you. I like that. What do you see? Huh? Wow. Out of that whole white screen, you see the black dot. Keep the proper perspective. Now, I've used this example before, but I have to use it a lot in my calling. The white screen represents everything that's going good in life. I mean, that's, you, you have your health at this point. You, you know, you, your wife loves you right now. And, 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 and you're, what? Your children still think you're cool, you know? This is, this is everything that's going good in life. Church is going okay. We're, we're paying the bills, you know. Ministry is happening. People are getting saved. We're baptizing people. There's still joy. You know, people come to church and they actually kind of like each other. I mean, everything's going good. But there's that one black dot. It's that one thing, or maybe two, or maybe five, that's happening in your life. And if you're not careful... You'll focus in, and all you see is that black negative dot in your life, and you forget everything else that is good and positive in your life. It's not what you look at that matters. It's what you see. What do you focus on? Now, look, we're not denying reality. I mean, life is like railroad tracks. The right track is everything that's going great in your life. The left track is everything that's going bad in your life, and they're connected together. Because that's life. And the train tracks take you up mountains, and it takes you down the valleys, and it takes you around curves. But you are still going to get to your destination. That is life. God never promised that when you accept Jesus Christ, that all of a sudden all the black dots go away. No, no, no. But what he did say was, you will overcome them because I have overcome the world. And so it's a matter of what you look at. And it's a matter of what you see when you look at it. And so the next time you're having a little pity party, pull out your white sheet of paper, get out your pen and put a dot right in the middle of it. And hold it up. 
And it ought to be a reminder to you that you need to focus on other things besides what is negative in your life. And trust God that in his proper timing, he'll take care of the black dot. And number 10, that's right, I'm done. You ready for this one? Never stop learning. Never stop learning. You're thinking that's a spiritual principle? Absolutely it is. Listen to this, Proverbs 18 to verse 15. The heart of the prudent acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. That's a spiritual principle. Always seek knowledge. Proverbs 23 and verse 12. Apply your heart to instruction and your ears to the words of knowledge. Never stop learning. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence... Add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge. Never stop learning. Now, the more you learn, the less you know. The more you learn, the less you know. 21 years ago, I didn't even know that I didn't know stuff. Today, I know that I don't know stuff, and I still don't know what it is I don't know. (laughs) But I'm still learning, and I'm still reading books. I still read some of the great thinkers of Christianity. I try really hard not to read any modern stuff. I want to know what did the great thinkers, what were the ones who gave their bodies to be burned at the stake? What did they know about God that gave them courage to do that? That's what I want to know. Never stop learning. Because it's a spiritual principle that the children of God give their hearts to instruction, their ears to knowledge, they persevere, and they seek it out. Amen. We stand to your feet with me this morning. As they're coming, if you would, if you'll just close your eyes where you are. I realized that today was fairly specific. I was dealing with graduation. So I put those thoughts in my mind. But I think they're applicable to the rest of us. It's a good reminder. No matter what we're going through, we have to realize that God is a good God. God is a God of love and he loves me too much to leave me where I am and the way that I am. He is in the process of working out all things for the good of me because I love him and I'm called according to his purpose and you can claim the same thing. Because that is God's nature. He is a good God. He loves you. You don't have to be afraid. Just follow the plan that he has for your life. It will come to pass. No matter what, you will overcome. You're a child of God. You can do no less. And just when you think you can't, God will send people into your life that have been designed to help you overcome. So embrace friendship you can be content even though you want more you can have peace and joy we have the assurance that no matter what God will provide for our needs and no matter what I'm going through the white space is always bigger than the black dot And when 
I come through this trial. It just means I learned a different aspect of God that I didn't know before. And there will be more because I never stopped learning. They're going to lead us in worship and I just want to challenge you for a moment to internalize what was said today, these points. Pray on them. Whatever area, one of those 10 or more than those that you're struggling with today, just say, God, acknowledge it. God, I'm struggling with that point. I'm struggling with being an overcomer. I'm struggling with keeping the proper perspective. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with knowing that you're a good God when I'm going through this bad thing. Just, just acknowledge what it is you're struggling with and ask the Lord to help you. I promise you, he will help you today. Can we do that? Let's take just a moment. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there's none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty Thank you, Lord. We thank you for your presence. Thank you, God, that you are a God of love. That you love me too much to keep me. In the place and in the position I am. But instead, God, you have destined good things for your children. Thank you that we have the ability to be faithful because of the Holy Spirit that you have sent upon us to indwell in us and to work through us. Lord, we pray for Madison. We pray for the others that are graduating college or will be graduating college. We ask God that your hand be upon them and that you would use them in the areas, the culture, which you've called them to be salt and light, advancing your kingdom until you return. It's in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. If you could help us set up for tonight in here, that would be really, really good. We need to set up this half, and uh, 
if you'll come meet us right here in front of the stage, we'll get you. We'll we'll tell you what to do. We just need to get some tables set up in here. Thank you for that.